Well, thanks for joining. And uh, we're going to get started here. Uh, today's presentation is actually going to cover use cases for software-defined storage. And this presentation is actually a uh, combination of a lot of work that we've been doing with our customers. So what we're going to do for the next uh, 45 minutes or so is we're actually going to be sharing some of the feedback and best practices that we've got as part of this um, journey that we're on to drive software-defined storage uh, in the mainstream markets. And, and a lot of times, some of the questions that come up as part of this is, where do I start? So hopefully, over the next um, uh, 45 minutes or so, we're going to try to explore uh, essentially where to start where to be able to find the right set of use cases and the right pain points to address in terms of adopting software-defined storage, and then how to take that and expand those footprints as we go forward. But before we do so, what I wanted to do uh, was just kind of explain a little bit on the journey we've all been on, and, and this is something that's been going on for some time. And in order to kind of set some context here, I want to be able to provide uh, some guidance that uh, Mark Andreessen uh, put together. It was actually an essay he did in the Wall Street Journal a little more than five years ago. And essentially the title of this essay was, Why is Software Eating the World? And, you know, the premonitions that he put forth in that were really driven around investment strategies and, and had a lot of details around financials and how these software companies and these cloud companies are effectively disrupting mainstream markets. And, you know, if you look at some of the examples that he had within there, he talks about, you know, talks about companies like Facebook and, and Amazon. And, and, you know, even five years ago, these companies were coming in to existing mainstream markets and completely disrupting those markets, changing not only how technology is deployed, but also changing fundamental business models and changing how people think about this. And so it, when you look at this, and you look at some of the logos on the right-hand side of this chart, it really kind of makes you think about, you know, what, what happened even in the five years since then? And, you know, where companies like you know, Uber and Airbnb are disrupting mainstream markets like the taxi industry, you know, you know industries that have been around for 80, 90 years, or the hotel industry, these are being completely disrupted now by these companies that are essentially taking software, driving software in the mainstream markets, and completely changing business models and how people think about that, right? I mean, the, the whole concept of Netflix, which is kind of near and dear to a lot of us because, you know, like, like many of you, I, I spend, uh, you know, a fair amount of my free time uh, perusing Netflix. And, and you think about how Netflix started, right? They started essentially as a DVD delivery service, but what they did is they built out their infrastructure, they built out their network, they were able to continue to disrupt and drive innovation into the market. And how did they do that? They did it really via software, and it's all about software. But if you look at essentially how, you know, where we are right now, and that's where we're kind of focused today, is if you think about cloud and how cloud infrastructures were built and how Amazon and Google and Microsoft with their Azure solutions are delivering infrastructure and platform services, essentially in a cloud-based model. But when you look at their core fundamental data centers, within the data centers, what you're not going to find within these modern infrastructure environments is you're not going to find traditional storage arrays. Because they knew up front, and, and these were you know, companies five, ten years ago that were building out these, these infrastructures, they knew that trying to build a data center using legacy enterprise architectures was a non-starter, both from a services standpoint because of the scale that these services had to be delivered, but more importantly, from an economic standpoint. Just because of the data growth and the amount of data put into these networks was going to far exceed anything that could have been delivered using traditional array-based technology. So, you know, one of the takeaways that, you know, as we look at this market is the fact that modern data centers, and whether it be a, you know, web scale service provider or even just an enterprise or a mid-sized business that's dealing with massive data growth, you can't grow your environments using 
yesterday's technology. And so essentially the next wave of disruption is really around infrastructure. And so, you know, when Andreessen said back in 2011, software's eating the world, I take it even further to say that software's now eating infrastructure. And, and it's happened on the compute side. So if you look at what companies like VMware and Citrix have done in terms of innovating software to be able to take that compute layer and completely virtualize it, and in terms of what's happening now in the next wave of disruption around containers, these are all software-driven infrastructures. And so the compute layer has been disrupted. Networking has obviously had been disrupted. And, and you look at the billion dollars that VMware spent on NYSERA to be able to bring software-defined networking in. And where companies like Cisco or Juniper, you know, that are traditional networking vendors, they've realized this and are quickly moving away from hardware-based infrastructure towards software. But the final frontier in all of this is storage. And, and as, as is typical, storage is always the last one to take, take that step. So the good news is, and if you look at some of the numbers, the good news is, is that because of the amount of capacity growth and the increasing digitization of infrastructure out there, that capacity growth is going to continue to grow and, and the predominant model for delivery of these services is going to be based on cloud. And, and if you look at some of the projections, and, and I'm, I'm showing a projection here, they're saying that a 28% CAGR, you know, compound annual growth rate, for cloud storage between now and 2020. Just massive amount of growth. So this is, this is great for companies like Amazon and, and Google and, and Microsoft Azure in terms of delivering these cloud services just because of the fact you're going to get broader and broader adoption. But on top of that, there's a lot of workloads and applications that because of either confidentiality or security concerns may not be a natural fit for cloud right away. So how do you deliver these types of services within your own infrastructure to be able to address this massive growth? I can tell you it's not going to be using traditional storage arrays. The ability to do so is going to be driven based on software. And that's really where software-defined storage comes in. And so if you look in that same five-year period, whereas cloud storage projected to have essentially a 20%, 28% compounded annual growth rate, software-defined storage is projected to grow at 34%. So if you look at this market, and, and albeit it's starting from a smaller base, but the amount of growth we're expecting within software-defined storage is actually greater than the cloud storage growth in the market itself. So it's great to be right at this kind of point in, in inflection within the market to be able to take advantage of that. But now if you double click and you take a look at enterprise storage sales in this same period, what's been happening is that you're now getting a decline on storage revenue. And the traditional three-letter providers, right, you know, EMC, which is now uh, combined with Dell, HP, IBM, NetApp, you know, with the exception of HP, they've all been losing market share and been losing revenue growth. So essentially what that says is that customers are moving away from traditional array-based technologies and moving toward alternatives. Obviously, one alternative is cloud. The other alternative is based on software-defined storage, and that's what we're going to look at here today. The other point I want to, I want to bring out is that if you look at where the growth is going to, in other words, you know, you've got negative – uh, you know, minus 5, minus 23 on the IBM side, minus 14 on NetApp. So you've got double-digit growth in some cases, or double-digit erosion in some cases for these array-based vendors. But you look where the double-digit growth is coming from. It's coming from others, right? And so that's essentially software-defined solutions that are coming into the marketplace. So it's a collection of other providers in this space, as well as ODM Direct. And so when I think about ODM Direct, essentially what that is is that is the – infrastructure that's being delivered in, in the format and the form factor of server-based infrastructure being delivered to these cloud providers and to customers that are deploying software-defined storage. And this trend is going to continue. This is just really the beginning of it. And, and just to kind of even put a finer point on this, if you take all those numbers and you look at what's been happening since 2013, this is not a new phenomenon. This is not something that's been happening, you know, over the last year, the last couple of years. This has actually been happening over the past four years, three or four years. And so for a lot of customers that are right now at, you know, let's say the end of a lease on an existing array-based technology, and we talk to a lot of these customers today, 
they're struggling with the fact that what do I do, right? That, you know, they're kind of right at this point here where the market essentially is eroding. They are in the midst of a refresh on their existing technology. So they're trying to figure out how do I address this? How do I go after these specific requirements to be able to drive change in my data center and mainly to be able to, you know, sustain double-digit capacity growth in the light of flat budgets? Because a lot of times, a lot of customers we're talking to, they're not only dealing with flat IT budgets. In many cases, the infrastructure side of those IT budgets are essentially going down. So you have to de deal with double-digit growth and the fact of flat or declining infrastructure budgets on the IT side. And then on top of that, you have some of the providers in the market, such as Gartner and some of the other analysts out there that are essentially providing guidance that, you know, your traditional storage vendor is no longer the risk-free option that there are alternatives out there, and because of this revenue slide and continued erosion in the rate-based technologies, you know, going with the big three-letter vendors anymore is not always a safe bet, just because of the fact if they're going to continue to lose market share and continue to lose to other cloud solutions and software-defined solutions, those product lines will start going away. So if, if you're interested in this research, this is research that was published Again, about a year ago. So this is not a new phenomenon. I would definitely take, you know, for any of the Gartner subscribers, I would definitely take advantage of the, the research there, and uh, I, I can provide some information at the end to get specific information on it. But the other side of that is the fact that, you know, if you look at some of the projections that are coming out of Wikibon and uh, a report that was done by the market realist, they're essentially saying that the decline has already started, and, and that's the, the red, the green, uh, arrow that you're seeing there, the dark green arrow, that's the decline of the enterprise storage at the growth of both hyperscale and enterprise class software defined storage. So it's clear, at least from the industry analysts and what we're hearing from our customers, is that the trend's already started, and once it started, that tidal wave continues. And so now this is kind of a good way to be able to segue into why now? I mean, what's driving a lot of this innovation, what's, what's causing the change, you know, out there that's, you know, driving this? Because let's face it, there have been solutions in the market for years that are providing essentially software-based stored services running on standard x86 servers. But I think what's happened over the past three or four years is that the concept of scale-out storage using distributed architectures that are built upon the same principles that Google and Facebook and Box and Amazon built out their data centers, those are now available in commercial operators so that any IT director or any storage architect that's planning their infrastructure, they can now take advantage of these new technology innovations. And again, this, it's not something that's, that's brand new. This is technology that's been in the market, been proven in these hyperscale, web-scale deployments now for almost a decade, especially if you look at what Amazon's done in terms of innovating these solutions into the marketplace itself. On top of that, you have the continued decline of media that's being stuffed into these, you know, ODM serve, white box x86 server uh, solutions that are in the market. And, and now where this continues to erode in terms of cost per gigabyte, but the cost of flash and solid state technologies and technologies like 3D and DRAM, now really start to bring in a whole new dimension of performance because now you can start to get better performance out of these infrastructures as well. And again, this is all built on standard, industry standard x86 hardware, right? So leveraging the same technology that solutions like VMware and Citrix have been running on now for, again, over a decade. So this isn't something that's all brand new. And then you also have the movement towards open source where you have Solutions like OpenStack coming on the market that's helping to drive adoption and innovation out there. But on top of that, and this is, you know, everything I've talked about so far is all about technology. But if you take technology out of the equation and you start looking at customer requirements, because, again, that's, you know, as a supplier, a solution provider in the industry, and a supplier in the industry, we are beholden to our customers. So what matters to us is what's important to our customers. And if you look at the fundamental changes 
in these customer environments that have happened really over the past four or five years is data growth when matched with economics. There's a complete, um, you know, 180 in terms of the amount of data growth I have, but flat, or, you know, or declining IT budget. So the data growth economics model, essentially, if you keep doing what you're doing today, it, it, it's not a sustainable model going forward. On top of that, the whole movement towards agile processes, where now my, you know, rather than going with a 18-month waterfall development cycle, I'm now actually building apps and building this dynamic, elastic infrastructure to support a whole new model of application development processes that are completely modernizing and changing how applications are brought to market. On top of that, when you, when you come out of it, you know, five years ago talking to customers, they would have been talking about, you yeah, the cost of price per disk, and they would have been talking about, you know, you know economies of scale and, and cost reduction. But we didn't hear a lot of customers talking about agility. And if you think about why the cloud model has been so successful over the past 10 years, yeah, entry cost is low, right? I, I can essentially, you know, with a credit card, I can spin up an AWS S3 service and be operational very quickly and, and be able to do so at a very low uh, cost point. But as those services start to scale, my cost points go up to the point where now, I have to, now I've crossed over where it's actually more expensive to run it in the cloud than it is to be able to run it within my own data center, especially if I'm able to leverage open source uh, uh, industry standard hardware and the ability to leverage uh, you know, this scale-out software-based architecture. So agility is really one of the primary reasons why people move to cloud because of the fact I can have it right away. It's that instant gratification that my app dev teams need. And the whole concept of shadow IT in terms of these app dev teams spinning up instances on their own and essentially IT having to play a little bit of catch up there, we can now change a lot of how services are deployed within the data center by being able to provide that cloud infrastructure within your own private data center. So those are really a lot of the primary reasons why customers have started to move to these new technologies and why we're starting to see, you know, broader and broader adoption of software defined. But, you know, again, you know, a lot of the folks on the call here, they say, okay, that's great. But why me? I mean, why, why should I care? What's important to me? How is it going to help me in my job? And so if you look now at some of the transformational benefits that are available within these services, the ability to be able to drive uh, higher levels of agility within these data center infrastructures starts to become very, very important. So agility, as I mentioned before, starts to become a fundamental tenet of why I'm making these changes. But on top of that, it's the economics, right? How do I provide infrastructure that scales, adds new uh, capabilities, add, adds new services, but be able to do so with flat or declining uh, IT budgets, especially on the infrastructure side? Now customers are starting to look for better ways to be able to address the economic question. But if I do this and I deliver agility and I deliver economics, but I have to sacrifice performance, it's a non-starter. And some of the lines of business and some of the application owners, especially those that are on the database side where things like I.O. performance and application latency and throughput of services in these scale-out infrastructures start to become essentially more of a critical demand where if I can't give the business, the line of business, the performance SLAs that I could before, then regardless of the agility I'm providing, regardless of the economics, it's a non-start. And then on top of that, the other tenant that becomes non-negotiable is security and reliability. And we've heard this from, from our customers, even as we started doing, you know, trials at Formation two years ago, security and reliability become fundamental tenets of what we do. And so as we look at all of this, we try to address these requirements to be able to provide agile infrastructure that's very cost effective, start small and scale out, deliver enterprise grade performance. And I'm talking, you know, you know, millions of IOPS at you know millisecond latency levels but do so with security and reliability that even surpass what you can get within the existing storage array, 
that really starts to drive a lot of these conversations and, and what really gets attention, especially from some of our larger customers that have been planning some of these larger transformation products now for several years, they've been looking for technology solutions that essentially address, address all four quadrants within this uh, infrastructure. So, you know, what, how are we delivering this solution? What is this, what's the instantiation of the solution, at least from a formation standpoint? And so uh, our platform is called the Formation One Dynamic Storage Platform. It, it's a fully software-defined architecture. So essentially, we built this leveraging open source components, but built it as a complete solution that addresses requirements for traditional workloads. So I'm talking block and file workloads so I can service file systems and your traditional NFS space that were, you know, some of the existing uh, vendors have provided today. I can provide block services using an iSCSI interface, and I can provide objects for next generation application-based pla platforms using the S3 API. And so what this platform does is it now allows you with a single software platform and these software-based connectors, I can now deliver essentially services on a unified standpoint that allows me now to consolidate applications onto this platform and then scale that out leveraging a combination of flash and disk within the x86 platforms that we run upon. Within that, we have intelligent tiering. So I can map workloads back to the performance requirements of the applications in the environment. So if I have, you know, again, going back to the database example, if I have, you know, SQL and NoSQL databases that do require very tight latency, very good IOPS, good throughput within that, I can actually tier that to the underlying media that allows me to be able to service that. And then I can map it to a quality of service level. And we're going to detail this as we go through some of the use cases. We're going to detail how QoS is used within that. But QoS provides a fundamental mechanism that allows me the ability to be able to assign different prioritization levels to the different applications in the environment to prevent noisy neighbors from coming on and essentially impacting performance of my mission critical applications and allows me to deliver consistent performance at scale within these environments. And again, I can do so across both traditional workloads as well as modern workloads leveraging um, you know, uh, S3 APIs as a way to be able to essentially emulate cloud services within your own data center. We do so also by providing automation. So we actually have a uh, API-driven uh, interface that uses REST APIs as a way to be able to essentially expose our commands to the outside world, but it's fully automated. So it gives you the ability to be able to take um, date, you know, standard data management capabilities like creation of snapshots and clones. Uh, it gives you the ability to be able to automate a lot of those capabilities, but it's done so on top of a fundamental journaled architecture. So what the journaling does is it actually provides a continuous data protection engine integrated with the primary storage platform. So rather than buying external appliances that have to essentially be bolted on, it's another thing to fail, it's another thing to manage, we've actually integrated that capability right into the Formation One cloud domain. So now I can actually assign unique CDP recovery uh, policies to different applications and different workloads and allows me the ability to provide very granular recovery in these environments and then automate the creation of snaps and clones off of that that I can use for recovery purposes, I can use for DR testing, I could also use that as a way to be able to refresh test and dev environments that we'll talk about in some of the um, use cases that we go through there. But because of the fact this is a distributed architecture, it allows me, I can start small. So a lot of our early deployments started around 20 terabytes, but then scale out. And as I'm adding capacity by bringing in more storage nodes, adding in more flash and disk media via the x86 platform that I'm adding into the configuration, I'm scaling out not only my capacity, but I'm also scaling out performance. So what you're also going to see as you start small, but then start to scale these environments out to hundreds of petab uh, terabytes or in the petabyte ranges, 
you're actually going to see very linear performance because as I'm adding capacity, I'm actually adding scale that gives me a very linear scale and very linear growth within the environment. And so very compatible with these distributed modern applications that are built around, you know, things like Cassandra that allow me the ability to leverage these underlying NoSQL architectures that are distributed in nature but be able to provide a very reliable, very secure infrastructure that gives me tight control of performance and tight control on recovery. And so, you know, a lot of times when we have this conversation with customers, this is great. You know, the, 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 the feedback we always get is, hey, this is great technology, but I'm trying to find a strategic investment to attach this to. And, and one of the key messages and, and at least key learnings on our standpoint, as we've been doing this now for about four years, is the fact that this does not always require a strategic investment. As a matter of fact, and, and that's what I'm going to highlight in some of these use cases that I walked through, that you can actually start very tactically. A lot of our customers have done. They've actually looked at individual projects that allow them the ability to be able to start with a, a smaller project and then use that as a way to be able to deploy these services. So now let's take a look specifically at kind of the, the subject of this webcast, which is really around some of the use cases for software defined storage. And then I'll sprinkle in some, some customer examples just to give you an idea of how actual customers have deployed this and, and what it looks like within their, those environments. So I'm going to cover four areas. And, and before I do so, though, just keep in mind that the use cases are not limited here. I just wanted to keep this fairly succinct in looking really at the entry point in terms of where software-defined storage might fit within your own environment. And so I'm going to look at four areas. I'm going to look at integrated private cloud storage, which is really taking the virtualization capabilities that have been delivered on the compute side and now extending that into the storage layer. I'm going to talk about object platforms for app modernization. I'm going to talk about dynamic storage and how that can be used for DevOps and test dev to be able to provide better agility and mobility there. And then I'm also going to um, cover what this looks like in a managed service provider environment because we're getting a lot of interest from MSPs that are essentially providing alternatives to the large cloud providers, the Amazons of the world, and leveraging this uh, software-defined infrastructure as a foundational element of their uh, platform and infrastructure as a service delivery options. So the first use case I'm going to talk about here really covers the concept of taking these private, you know, integrated private cloud environments. And, and you know, regardless of whether it's built on, on VMware or Citrix Zen or, you know, Microsoft Hyper-V, essentially we're agnostic to the underlying um, hypervisor or the hypervisor that's delivering these services. Although I will say um, that we have done a lot of integration with, the VMware stack, just because they have their APIs are very, very conducive to be able to deploy these types of services uh, on, on a broad basis. And so we've tied into that. And I'll, and I'll highlight some of those integrations as we go forward. But really, when we talk to customers in this space, some of the challenges they're trying to address is really how do I provide integration for my storage layer into the hypervisor layer? So if I'm a, a VM admin, for example, how do I provide a single pane of glass that allows me to be able to provision these stored services on demand uh, in a multi-tenant environment? And, and when you talk about multi-tenancy, things such as security always come in, right? How do I provide firewalls between the different tenants in the environment so that essentially the data is secure, the data you know, does provide essentially a unique tenant access where the admin can see everybody, but essentially only the tenants can see the domains that they're responsible for. Uh, also, a, a lot of customers we talk to are having challenges around how do I scale performance with capacity? You know, adding capacity is easy, but one of the, you know, bottlenecks that exists within array-based architectures is that once I hit the saturation point on those controllers, even if I have 50% of my capacity available, I'm going to start to hit performance bottlenecks because of the fact that that controller can no longer keep up with the amount of capacity provided within those environments. The other you know, issue that we see come up a lot is uh, very high solution costs. So 
So solution costs and complexity start to become, you know, much more of an issue as you're starting to look at these solutions. And so as we look at customers, some of the outcomes that they're looking for is, you know, they want performance tiering, right? They're looking for the ability to be able to leverage x86 infrastructure with, you know, a lot of flash and a lot of SSD, but be able to provide essentially a tiering infrastructure that allows them the ability to consolidate applications, but then now start to dynamically tier to those workloads that are demanding more throughput, more I.O., and lower latency. So what we do within the formation system is we provide essentially an infrastructure that allows us to be able to map those workloads dynamically to those tiers and then provide essentially a QoS mapping to those workloads so that I can prioritize the workloads, assign a min and a max tier that essentially gives me a operating range that I'm always operating within. The max essentially, think of that as a ceiling, right, so that let's say for a particular workload, I want to make sure that it never exceeds, you know, 100,000 IOPS just because of the fact that that's what that application is rated for from a peak uh, IOPS standpoint. I can set that within it, and then I can also set a min that's essentially a guarantee. We will not oversubscribe the capacity and the performance within this system so that we ever go under that min. So the min and max, think of it as a low watermark and a high watermark that you continue to operate within. But then on top of that, we actually have a prioritization schema that allows us the ability to be able to map these workloads to priorities so that if indeed I do hit congestion points within my underlying compute infrastructure, that priority scheme kicks in and allows us the ability to be able to throttle the low priority applications so that the high priority applications always get their performance. So QoS is important, especially in a multi-tenant environment where you are delivering service levels back to your line of business. On top of that, because of the fact we have a journaled architecture, continuous data protection provides me the ability to be able to assign um, a specific workload with a specific recovery objective. So now that for my critical applications that are essentially running on this uh, hypervisor compute infrastructure, I can now actually map to those performance capabilities as well as protection capabilities that map back to the importance of the data. So it gives me very granular con control and also gives me protection against data corruption because this is always a, a challenge that when we talk to customers does tend to come up is how do I make sure that my uh, data protection is protect or my applications are protected against a data corruption event. So we do provide continuous data protection that allows us to be able to protect against corruption in the in, of event of a data corruption. We can essentially open the journal, roll back to the danger to the point in time just before that corruption took place, and then use that to recover. On top of that, we've got integration with hypervisors, as I mentioned before, mainly on the VMware side. So we've done integration with uh, the vCenter using uh, VMware's vCenter plugin, which is a great interface. What it does is that plugin allows us now, within the vCenter interface, I can manage all of these Formation 1 capabilities I've been talking about, QoS, CDP, performance, provisioning, snapshots, clones. This is all now managed within that vCenter interface. So that, again, from a uh, VM admin standpoint, as they're looking at how do I deploy these services without having to swivel chair between different management screens, that level of integration now provides a single pane of glass, a single console on which I can manage that. On top of that, you know, obviously because of the fact that we're deduping the data, we actually apply um, applying compression uh, to workloads as well. We can actually deliver, you know, greater than 80% cost reductions on your upfront capital costs. But then also from an operational cost standpoint, just because of the fact we've simplified the model, we've automated a lot of this, you're also getting operational cost savings as well in terms of the FTEs it requires to be able to manage, you know, a petabyte of storage within these environments. We've done a lot of software integration. So, again, leveraging the uh, APIs that exist, we have the ability to be able to take complete offloads from the VM infrastructure, from the hypervisor infrastructure, and provide all those backups and those secondary copies of data, either for repurposing or for data protection, we've offloaded all that so that now the hypervisor is not taxed as you're performing these uh, applications. And so when, when you're thinking about where to start, you know, a lot of our customers look at Tier 2, Tier 3 apps, right? 
um, or backup and archive type, type apps. And this is a great starting point because of the fact that this is where a lot of the growth is coming from. This is where you have a lot of pain points in terms of how do I manage this capacity growth with, with flat budgets. And it's also a great point to be able to look at how do I provide you know, DevOps or uh, agile, infrastructure, agile infrastructure for test dev as well. So again, you know, great starting points here, uh, but this is a, a use case that we're seeing deployed on a fairly regular basis uh, within our customer base. Now, as, as I promised, I also wanted to kind of highlight some customer examples here. Um, this one is actually a customer that's deployed uh, Formation One as a media repository. So they actually had some legacy hardware, but they are completely modernizing their customer experience as part of that. And so essentially, they knew going in they were going to replace their compelling infrastructure that, that's been in place now for about three and a half, four years and essentially evaluated the market and, and chose formation because of the following reasons, right? They were looking for that native integration. The, the DCP level integration that I just talked about was something that was very, very important to them, and they wanted to be able to make sure that they had the ability to be able to integrate with their underlying uh, VMware infrastructure. They were also looking for CapEx reduction. So they wanted the ability to be able to have an infrastructure that allowed them to lower their overall storage footprint cost point but then also provided them operational savings just because of the fact that, you know, they've, they've got a couple uh, guys on the IT staff that manage their very uh, you know, large, very diverse uh, infrastructure. So they needed something that provided some operational cost savings as well. Uh, so cost savings was really one of the initial uh, drivers for this particular customer. Um, they wanted better data protection because essentially they were, uh, you know, putting everything off tape and that was their primary uh, you know, recovery mechanism. So leveraging Timeline, which is our CDP engine, as well as integrated SNAP and, and clone mechanism, uh, we actually now gave, are giving them much better data protection, much tighter RPOs. And again, back to their management, it gives them much more assurances about how that data uh, is provided. And then uh, on top of that, because of the fact this is media streaming, so they wanted to be able to prioritize the, the data uh, streams that are essentially being delivered to the user kiosk because you know, if you hit a button and you're not getting that stream right away, you're moving on or you're checking out, right? So they wanted to make sure that they could prioritize the media streams delivered to the kiosks so that the customer experience was immediate and provided, you know, that data without interruption out across there. So they leveraged our, our QoS mechanism as a way to be able to prioritize those media streams. But there was also important to them, just because they're a growing uh, organization, they wanted to be able to future-proof their architecture. They, they know that the technology they're deploying on today, which is mainly a uh, NFS-based uh, infrastructure, you know, essentially has a fixed life cycle, and they didn't want to have to rip and replace when they started to move towards object-based infrastructure, which is part of their plan going forward, because as they modernize all their infrastructure and, and all their applications, they want to make, be able to make sure that the infrastructure can support those growth needs as they go forward. So it was really important for them to do that, but at the same time be able to provide analytics about how this is used within the environment. So a lot of the capabilities we provide from an analytics standpoint gave, gives them a lot of insight about how the data is being used on the customer engagement side. So the, I'm, I'm going to rip through the next couple of use cases relatively quickly because there are some common themes here, but I really want to focus on the challenges because you know, my challenge to, to you on the line here and, and those that are you in the replay is to look at your own environment and, and to look where you might be able to map these use cases and map these challenges back to your day-to-day -day and look potentially for areas where this might be able to help. So when I'm looking at DevOps and, and test dev environments, these are really non-production applications or applications that are being scaled to be able to map into production applications. So you look at uh, electronic manufacturing and, and EAD and electronic design. These are all the types of mechanisms that work very well into this. But a lot of times when customers do this today, they have a array for test and dev, and, or they may have separate arrays, one for test and one for dev, and then another set of arrays for production. And so one of the pain points that a lot of our customers explain is that the migration of data from test to dev or dev to test and then test to production, those migration cycles are huge. And a lot of these customers are in very competitive environments where if they can shave 
you know, hours off those migration cycles because some of them, especially when you're talking about these large electronic files, some of these may take hours or days to get migrated from one array to the next. It's just a non-starter. So they're looking for a way to be able to provide much shorter cycles to go from dev to test to uh, production. Also resource scaling across these environments because, you know, especially in dev and test environments, my capacity growth and my need for additional resources needs to be elastic. And that's why a lot of customers that are looking at these types of solutions move to cloud. But for a lot of these very competitive industries, data security, data integrity, data management starts to become much more important than that agility, so they feel like they, they have to trade off. Well, essentially what our story is, is what we do is we build elastic infrastructure, but we do so with security within the confines of your own data center. So it provides essentially the ability to leverage these kind of new technologies as a way to deploy that. But you want to be able to get better efficiency and better control, right? So I want the ability to be able to essentially have a, a shared pool of resources that I can spin up when I need them and then spin them back down, put them back in the pool when I'm completed. So these all fit very nicely into these dev test models. But now when you start looking at production, and the ability to be able to migrate applications into production environments, you want to make sure that these production environments always get priority. And so that's where QoS comes in, because now I can essentially assign within this consolidated infrastructure that I'm serving both my dev and test environments, I can also run production applications with confidence, because I know that my QoS is going to deliver um, you know, a guaranteed service level back to the production applications in the environment. And so when looking at dev test and, and you know, test dev, type environments or, or DevOps types environments, you know, those new app development projects are great for this type of, of environment. So when you're looking at bringing on, you know, new app dev projects, uh, DevOps type projects, um, look at this type of infrastructure to be able to do that because it's very conducive to be able to provide a elastic infrastructure with a very low cost point that allows you the ability to be able to scale this out as your dev test uh, needs scale as well. Okay. And so that's a great transition now when I'm talking about modern applications and these new applications in the environment it is to, to look at object, right, and, and the role that object plays within the whole concept of application modernization. And so, you know, as I, as I talked about in the DevOps and, and the test dev uh, model, a lot of the pain points within these environments does come around essentially the need to be able to have um, better control of my capacity growth and be able to scale my infrastructure to be able to support these uh, new requirements. And this is where a lot of times companies move to cloud day one. So they may move to cloud right away to be able to provide uh, that capability. But on top of that, what ends up happening, and, and we've heard this, this story a number of times, is that what ends up happening is that the AWS infrastructure and, and other cloud providers, I'm not just picking on Amazon, but uh, you know, again, a lot of examples we work with are customers that have deployed in Amazon. They'll put their dev and test uh, infrastructure in Amazon just because of the fact it's agile, it's elastic, allows me the ability to be able to do so. But now, as I start to transition these applications into production, just because of all the bandwidth charges into and out of that cloud infrastructure, now my bill goes up from what started very small my total cost of ownership now starts to go up. And so the bandwidth costs start to become a factor when looking at applications that tend to have a lot of uh, transitions and transfers um, into and out of the network. And so looking at these types of environments, uh, automation becomes big, so the ability to leverage a REST API to be able to automate creation uh, of provisioning of, of volumes, the ability to be able to automate snaps and clones, all starts to become very, very important here. Uh, those that are actually looking at this are also looking at things such as Docker as a way to be able to provide essentially, you know, finer granularity in terms of my application development and delivery out across there. So these are areas that start to become very, very important. But the outcomes people are looking for is they're looking for storage infrastructure that scales out, right? They want the ability to be able to start small, scale these out, and be able to provide migration between you know, traditional NFS-based um, deployments and be able to transition some of these workloads now into an object store. And so really the, the best way to be able to do that is to be able to provide a common layer, a common construct underneath of that, leverage 
uh, the Foration One software connectors as a way to be able to deploy these. So similar to the test dev case I just talked about, when you're looking at objects, a great place, you know, use case to start is around these app dev or DevOps projects and the ability to be able to leverage these um, AWS to private cloud migrations where I can essentially start to take some of these data sets now, bring them back into an S3 construct within my data center, but then the ability to be able to deploy it either as EBS or as a, um, you know, leveraging EC2 services, uh, or the ability to be able to leverage some of the native Amazon services uh, based on S3. So these are, again, great use cases as we look at this. Uh, the final use case I'm going to talk about here is really around managed service rights and, and how MSPs look at the, the market and how they're trying to address some of these requirements as they come up. A lot of these environments, they're always multi-tenant, right? So it's rare that you have a managed service writer that's not talking about multi-tenancy as being a fundamental requirement as part of that. So the ability to be able to deploy this now provides a multi-tenant environment, but also supports mixed workloads, where I can have some workloads that are uh, very demanding in terms of the I.O. and throughput, other workloads that are lower priority. And so what you end up with as a service writer in this is that you're essentially forced to be able to support multiple application types, right, block, file, object, multiple hypervisors, and different protocols out across there. But you want the ability to be able to do so and offer different service levels back to the tenants that are essentially um, looking for the service delivery. And so, you know, the, the whole concept of a, a platinum tier, a, a gold, a silver, a bronze tier now starts to make a lot of sense, but how do you enforce that? So how you enforce that is essentially by providing a QoS mechanism that now allows you to be able to enforce workload prioritization and then a monitoring mechanism that allows you to be able to monitor my performance against those SLAs. I, but I want to be able to do so on a very cost-effective standpoint. In other words, I want the ability to be able to essentially build out infrastructure that can start small, a couple hundred terabytes, and then scale out to petabytes as I need to. So you want that scale out capability, but it has to be very cost effective. And so a, a lot of times when we're working with these MSPs, a lot of them are looking at either these kind of tier two applications. And, and the customer example I'm going to talk about in just a minute is actually a customer that deployed Ceph, spent you know, several years trying to get Ceph to become to a point of, of stability and deliver decent performance. And essentially, the conclusion they came to was that they couldn't do it. That, you know, and again, for a number of reasons, for their specific requirements, Ceph did not meet the requirements around availability, around scale, and around performance. So essentially, by deploying Formation 1, they uh, use these as a way to be able to provide uh, block and file-based services, but then are also looking at object as a way to be able to provide an alternative leveraging these object-based platforms. So this is a great segue to be able to talk about how these um, you know, MSPs and provide a specific example about how these MSPs are addressing these specific requirements. So the, the customer I talked about, and, and again, this is uh, a customer up in Canada uh, that's actually deployed Formation 1 as a, as a way to be able to replace the Ceph installation that just had serious performance and scaling issues. And, and essentially, they had just thrown, thrown their hands up um, and looked at alternatives um, did a little bit of a bake off and then selected uh, formation as, as an end result. And the benefits this customer saw as a result of this was the fact that right away they had much more enterprise functionality. The ability to leverage snapshots and clones and all these capabilities now started to bring them up to the same level of their competition and be able to provide an alternative to internal IT services within their managed service provider environment. They also needed be better data protection. So data protection was a core requirement of this particular service provider because of the fact that they needed the ability to be able to deliver better data protection and recovery out across these environments. But they needed the ability to have infrastructure that was highly resilient, fault tolerant, so that they could lose drives, they could lose complete storage nodes, but the service delivered back to that end customer was fault tolerant. In other words, the, the, that was completely transparent. Any underlying failures on the hardware was completely transparent, and the user did not see uh, any outages as a result of that. Um, so, you know, that goes back to 
delivering service levels back to the business and delivering service levels back to their customers because in many of these uh, MSP environments, their SLAs are tied to financial penalties so that if indeed I don't meet those specific requirements, uh, I do have the ability to be able to essentially, I, I have to pay a penalty back to that, and, and no one likes to, to do that. So, again, the ability to be able to monitor SLAs and deliver consistent performance to be able to meet those SLAs was increasingly important to these MSP environments. And then also, because of the fact they have their own cloud service provisioning platform, they want the ability to be able to automate you know, a, a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks so that their storage admins and architects can focus on architecting the next set of solutions rather than having to do the day-to-day -day management of volumes and snapshots and all that. So a lot of that had been automated, uh, leveraging our REST API as a way to be able to instrument those capabilities and provide a, a seamless integration into a cloud service provisioning uh, platform. So again, great example here of how you know, this customer leveraged this platform uh, as a way to be able to deploy you know, this type of service. And so, you know, as as we do this, a lot of a lot of times they say, okay, you know, how do I start? Where where do I start? You know, and, and a lot of the customers I've talked about that have looked at these use cases have really kind of followed these three steps. Uh, and the first step I'd recommend, and, and if there's any call to action out of this, I would absolutely recommend you take a look at a demo, right? And when we could do a custom demonstration that essentially shows us within an environment that resembles yours, we can show you how you know, in 15 minutes, how we can actually provide, um, you know, solutions to the pain points you have within your own environment. And a lot of times what also helps, especially if you're trying to convince your management that this, you know, this is important, is we can do a TCO assessment, right? And the TCO assessment, you know, with a, a basic understanding of your environment about what your current storage looks like, what's your capacity growth, what's the makeup of it, we can actually now map that out against what TCO would look like leveraging formation software-defined storage, and in most cases, we can save you up to about 90%, right? And that's a 10x type save. We're not talking 10% here. We're talking 10x savings out across there. And then, you know, obviously, once you kind of take those two steps, what always happens after that is a deeper dive. I want the ability to be able to get a better understanding of what this is going to look like within my environment, and then the ability to be able to leverage that as part of, um, you know, what I'm doing to deploy these types of services uh, within my environment. So again, three simple, simple steps, but it just gives you a, a good format in terms of uh, how I want to be able to leverage this within my own environment. And, and so, you know, as I mentioned before, a, a good way to look at this is how do I implement these in projects, right? So a lot of times we work with customers that are essentially starting on the ground floor, right? They're, they're looking at these kind of tactical solutions around test dev and tier two and uh, IT applications and back of an archive as a way to be able to deploy uh, this at scale within your own environments. And then as we do so, you know, again, what I ask, um, you know, viewers to do is to kind of pick a pain point within your own organization. And as part of that, we're looking at, you know, things such as scale and speed and cost and flexibility. These are typically pain points we run into in any customer. So if you look at those four, I guarantee you, you talk to 10 customers, and eight out of the ten are going to you know, address these specific pain points. So as you're looking at these projects and you're looking at how to be able to do this, you know, consider what this might look like in your own environment, especially those uh, that are engaged with the kind of app modernization, uh, data center modernization, and DevOps team, because they're the ones that are really starting to drive a, a lot of these types of solutions. So it's an excellent starting point. Definitely one of the things I would recommend. Uh, the final thing I'd recommend is, you know, uh, go to formationds.com. Uh, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one briefing and a demo. And we are still running the GOAT campaign, so that's kind of the whole reason behind the GOAT on, on the chart here, is that essentially for every demo that we give, we donate a GOAT to a, a family in a third world country uh, through an organization called Oxfam. So, uh, again, this is a, a great way to be able to do something that's good for your organization, but also gives back and makes you feel good. So this has been something that's been uh, very popular and, again, something we continue to do uh, to be able to give back uh, to the environment. And so, you know, as mentioned within the promotion for this webcast, uh, we do actually have an Amazon gift card. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to do a random drawing for those that are in the, um, the audience 
uh, right now, and uh, we will essentially uh, announce the winner via email. So good luck to everyone that's on the line here, but uh, again, just something we like to do as a way to be able to say thank you for your time. Um, I, I know we're running up against the top of the hour here. Um, I did uh, promise that I'd check the Twitter feed um, in terms of the questions that came on the tweet deck. Um, so I'm just going to switch to another window here. Okay, so a couple questions did come in. Um, once QoS is set on formation, how can it be modified? So great question. So we get this one a lot. So the question itself is, or the QoS itself is dynamic. So the ability to be able to set the QoS is actually a, a command that actually operates within our GUI or can actually operate within the uh, API as well. So uh, essentially I can go in and I can modify the min-max values as well as the prioritization on the fly with IO in transit. So I can essentially adjust my QoS mechanisms dynamically across the system. Uh, also maps back to the tiering. So if I'm using a hybrid uh, SSD flash, uh, the QoS actually takes advantage of, of some of that as well. Uh, let's see, uh, what kind of NFS use cases are a good fit formation? So the good question, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a lot of NFS that's deployed uh, within that. So uh, the ability to be able to uh, deploy uh, NFS fits into your traditional file system. So think of where I might use a NetApp filer or I might use a, a VNX with an NFS interface. Essentially, we're a direct replacement for that. One of the things you're going to get as a result of this is you're actually going to get better performance and better controller performance. You're also going to get much better uh, cost performance because of the fact that we're starting from a lower uh, hardware cost standpoint. And then, again, our, our software licensing, the cost points are, are very uh, low on that as well. So it gives you a, a good uh, use case around NFS file shares or anything where I might use a NetApp or a traditional um, NAS array. Um, formations a direct fit on that because again we've, we've emulated and provided a, a very strong uh, footprint for the uh, NFS use case. Uh, another question on the Twitter line here and again I'll, I'll keep it open here until the top of the hour. Um, how is Formation 1 priced uh, and is it software only or can I get an appliance? So um, Formation is priced essentially on a uh, a capacity-based model, but it's the subscription model. Now, most of our customers buy, you know, one, two, or three years upfront paid subscription, but what we do is we include maintenance and everything all in as part of that subscription. So on the software side, and you can buy the software, only run it on your own x86 hardware, uh, and we do maintain a hardware compatibility list, you can deploy that software only. If you do prefer an appliance, we actually work with um, uh, partners that have the ability to be able to deliver an appliance-based uh, solution, that what they do is they take the core x86 hardware platform, they actually integrate our software on top of it, and then deliver that as a complete appliance solution. All the brake fix is provided by the partner, so you get hardware brake fix, you get full maintenance, full warranty on the hardware, and then we actually provide um, you know, first-line customer support, triage, and uh, capabilities as part of that. So. Uh, great questions. Uh, keep them coming. I'm just going to do a quick refresh here on my Twitter screen just to see if any other questions came in. Um, so I have no questions remaining on the line here. So again, uh, top of the hour, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and conclude the presentation at this time. And as I mentioned, we will uh, send the uh, winner of the Amazon gift card an email to essentially thank them and congratulate them for this. Um, thank you very much for your uh, your time, and uh, look forward to our next presentation um, uh, coming up in uh, next month, Thursday, November 17th. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about secure hybrid cloud storage and AWS integration for DR. Uh, we're actually honored that uh, we have a guest speaker for this next webcast. His name is Scott Sinclair, and he is the senior uh, analyst for the Enterprise Strategy Group. So what Scott's going to be doing is he's going to essentially, you know, take the bulk of this presentation and essentially provide 
some insights into drivers around hybrid cloud storage and the requirements for disaster recovery and data protection uh, leveraging uh, AWS infrastructure. So definitely sign up for that. That is on our Bright Talk channel today. Uh, our final one of 2016 is going to be on December 14th. And we're actually going to be doing a uh, case study around software-defined storage. So again, thank you for your time. I'm going to go ahead and conclude the presentation at this time. I uh, appreciate the feedback. I've already got some feedback on that. Uh, we'll keep the Twitter line open. So again, if, if you do have uh, any questions, you can tweet to FormationBS or use the hashtag NOAA Thank you very much, and have a great day.